It's a wonderful time just to introduce our time with the Word of God as well, uh, just to kind of introduce you with a subject matter that's a little bit sometimes a, a, a prickly issue. There are issues in the Bible that are prickly issues, and of course the, the whole subject matter of uh, hypocrisy and even what you have on your outline in front of you is getting our Getting to the heart of hypocrisy, that's one of those uh, prickly issues as well, too. So I just want to uh, introduce uh, you to our time in God's Word today. We are going to be talking about the, the Pharisees and scribes of, of Jesus' day and what they were all about. Uh, but we want to do this with an objective eye, looking at the Word of God and seeing what the Word of God, how it has to bear upon all this. I want to just encourage you to turn in your Bibles to the passage that we want to look at today. And that passage is uh, Matthew chapter 15. It's not Matthew chapter 23. It's Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 through 14, so if you want to turn there now, uh, we'll get, that'll get us on our way. And we'll start at Matthew chapter 15, uh, verse 1 in a minute. Just want to introduce you uh, to this passage for some of you who are kind of revisiting this, maybe after uh, missing a, a Sunday or two here. Uh, we are going through the entire book of, of Matthew, which is 24, 28 chapters, and uh, I think we're just coming close to the midpoint of here of, 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 of the life of Jesus Christ in the book or in the gospel of Matthew, and it's kind of interesting uh, uh, at this midpoint uh, through the whole narrative account of Christ's earthly ministry we kind of, get, kind of get to see uh, the kinds of people that Jesus encountered. And we know that they are not all of, uh, not all of the same cut of life. They, they varied across the board, across the spectrum. Many a times in the past chapters that we've revisited throughout the book of Matthew, it's, it's really been enjoyable. In fact, I, I've been, uh, been encouraged by just seeing the different snippets, the different snapshots of people coming towards Jesus, and they're coming towards Jesus with a needy heart. That's so, so important when you see that in Scripture. Uh, how many times can you enumerate or count the number of times you've seen somebody and uh, perhaps they have a family member who has a disease or somebody is dying in their family. Perhaps they themselves are struggling against some kind of an ailment of various kinds. And you see what happens uh, time and time again. There's a, a sense of, within the nation of Israel, a sense of humility, a sense of God has brought me to uh, the, the bottom of my rope, uh, the, the very rock bottom, and, and people are crying out for help. And, and time and time again, you see how the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, he stands and he delivers over and over again. The people come to him with various diseases. Sometimes it's just the hunger, the lack of food. That's what we visited last time in Matthew 14. And Jesus comes on the scene and he delivers. He provides food for whole masses of people. And there is an interesting scene throughout Scripture uh, around the book of Matthew where you don't see just Jesus uh, healing people of their diseases. He goes one step further. If they're really looking at him with a sense of dependence in their heart, they're looking to him with a longing eye saying, how are you going to help me, Lord? He does this. He actually says, your sins are, what? Forgiven. And that is just an amazing thing to see that that was going on in Israel. There were people coming to Christ, and they were, they were at the rock bottom point in their life, and they were looking to Christ. How will you, how will you help me? You're, you're the one who can help me. How are you going to help me? And Jesus stands, and he delivers over and over again. There is that uh, wonderful thing just to see that humility uh, crop up in, in the land of Israel. But there's the other side of, of it as well, too. And the other side of humility is what? If it's not humility, it's usually banking towards Pride, pride, exactly. And that's what you see with uh, the Pharisees and the scribes uh, in our passage. And these are men who were uh, learned men. They knew the word of God. Uh, they went to the equivalent of a seminary or something like that where they gained a lot of head knowledge. And they, where other people perhaps didn't know the Torah or the writings of Moses that well, well, the Pharisees and the scribes, you could look to them to kind of articulate what Moses had said because they, they knew the Torah. They knew how to read Hebrew and all of that. So with knowledge comes a great weight of, of just your ability to actually uh, lead people as well, too. That's what I think I am reminded to about as even I stand up here. If you've been endowed with knowledge, the next thing is you have a stewardship. It's in your hands. The Bible's in your hand. You better not, what, drop the ball. Uh, unfortunately, with regards to the Pharisees and the scribes, they dropped the ball big time. They dropped it so hard that, that it left a lot of lives around them shattered. And that's a good, um, just a warning to all of us, not just to the people that we're reading about in the text. But there was an, there was an air of pride with regards to the, the scribes and the Pharisees. 
It's sort of like they, they, they did their time reading the Word of God, but the essence and, the, and what the, the priorities of Scripture were in the Bible, in the Torah, was really secondary, and, and it was soon uh, becoming away from their minds. As Greg shared earlier from Matthew chapter 23, uh, there is a point in which Christ, uh, line by line, spells it out for the scribes and the Pharisees after they've taken people astray so often. And he calls them this word, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an acerbic word. It's not a word that I would throw around in my own speech with other people at all. And it's a word that starts with the letter H, and it's hypocrite. And you've heard this before. People say this sometimes on Twitter or on social media. They'll say, if they're really irate about somebody, they'll say, well, he's a, a hypocrite or she is a hypocrite. Uh, that is not a, that's not a word just to throw around. And Jesus uses it, uses it very sharply in a particular way with regards to mostly, mostly the, uh, the, the Pharisees and the scribes. We can ask the question, what do, what do people mean when they say hypocrite? And that's what, what I like to ask, first of all, before we ever get into anything about uh, what we're reading here. When you, somebody says hypocrite, what do they mean? Uh, the Webster's, uh, Merriam-Webster's uh, definition of hypocrisy or, or a hypocrite is a, a person who puts a false appearance of virtue and religion. Let me say that again. A person who puts on a false appearance of virtue and religion. So they don't exactly practice what they preach. And, and it's all under the veneer, the outward show of religion with that. But what I want to do today, uh, this morning, is to give a more precise definition that I believe uh, we can use and we can see, actually see in this text as to how we might define hypocrisy from the Bible, even from Jesus' own words. And that is that hypocrisy is claiming a higher moral or religious ground, claiming the high ground at the expense of actual obedience to the word of God. Let me say that again. Claiming higher moral religious ground at the expense of what you would expect a person would do, and that is actual obedience to the word of God. Another way of putting it on, on, on a positive way is that if you are actually obeying, now this is not unto perfection. We're not talking about perfectionism here. But you, by and large, you're mostly obeying the word of God, walking by faith in all of this. We could say this from scripture, you are not a hypocrite. I feel like I need to say that at the very forefront here because uh, just by raise of hands, how many of you have met somebody, they're not a believer, they don't go to church, you ask them, why don't you go to church? Well, the answer should be obvious if they're not a believer. But they might answer this way, the reason I don't go to church is because the church is full of hypocrites. How many of you have heard something like that before? Yeah, it's, it's, it's out there. It seems sort of like people just know how to say that. And we have to ask the question, sir or ma'am, what do you mean by hypocrite? Are you, are you asking for people to be perfect all the time? They never have to confess sin? Is that what you're requesting? That's a pretty high, that's a pretty, uh, that's setting the bar pretty high if that's the case. No, uh, Jesus, I, I would just uh, enter this at the very forefront. I think this will help you to know this. There is only one person that uses the word hypocrite in the second person in all of Scripture. In all of the Bible. And it's used more than once. And who is that person who uses that word hypocrite? Jesus Christ. <laughs> he is the only one who's qualified to say, you hypocrite, to the Pharisees, to the scribes, to anyone. I'll have you know that. No one else, no one else uses that word but Jesus Christ. And he uses it in a particular way. It's when uh, there's somebody on the scene and they're leading the, the hearts of the people away from the gospel. They're leading the hearts of the people away from what God has always, always said from his word. That's when Jesus uses that, that descript, descriptive word. So without further ado, I don't want to get into this uh, too much too fast. I just want to slow down a little bit. But I want us to consider the, the passage that is set before us today that will really spell out uh, how we can get, our, get to the heart of hypocrisy, this rather cantankerous and hard and difficult and, and acerbic word. So let us look now at Matthew chapter uh, 15, starting at verse 1. This is after the scene of, of, of Jesus walking on the water and as well uh, doing several healings and, and that, things of that nature. Word has gotten around about Jesus and his ministry. Uh, he's, in the, he's near the Sea of Galilee at this time, and, and there's people that are going to meet with him, and they are the Pharisees who come all the way from the land of Jerusalem. And it says in verse 1, the Pharisees and the scribe came to Jesus 
that is from Jerusalem, that's 100 miles away, and they said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me, it's given to God, sorry. You say that he not need honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Verse 10. And he called the people to himself. This is a turning point where Jesus just turns around, away perhaps from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, and he turns away from them. He looks to the people who are just listening to all this. And he called the people uh, to him, and he said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this is what defiles a person. The disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they... They heard this saying, Jesus answered them, he said to them, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. What we're going to be looking at today is, again, is somewhat of a hard subject matter to take on. It's not as easy, I think, as as the previous passages that we have looked at. Today we want to look at three ways that we can recognize religious hypocrisy. Three ways we want to recognize religious hypocrisy so that our worship of the Lord remains pure. And I would add to that as well too, so that we have the right understanding of the biblical gospel as well too. All of this is essential to the understanding of the gospel. What kind of heart we come before the Lord with. Is it a heart of pride or is it a heart of humility? Well, you're going to see a, a sort of a colossal separation here with regards to the heart of the Pharisees versus those who have, with uh, the, being at the end of the rope, have uh, looked to Christ for answers and, and received the, the grace of our Lord. There's a colossal difference. There's a, a continental divide here with regards to how the Pharisees are with their heart versus other very needy people around Jesus. The first thing that we want to look at by way of outline is the infestation of hypocrisy. That's in verse 1 and 2, the infestation of hypocrisy. Later on in verse uh, 3 through 9, we'll look at the inverted triangle of hypocrisy. That's sort of maybe a strange picture to you, but think of a ladder or a pyramid and turning it upside down, the inverted triangle of hypocrisy. And then finally, lastly, we want to look at the irony the irony of hypocrisy, how people think that they're going to get something really good at the end by being a, basically a religious hypocrite. And of course, what they get in the end is the pit of hell, like it says at the end there in verse 14. So the first thing we want to look at is the infestation of hypocrisy. And this will be kind of interesting for you. I, I make sure that uh, when I'm up here, I don't be boring. And this is how you be not boring up here. You share interesting things about the text. That's how you do it. That's how it works with me. Sometimes I'm, I'm studying this and I'm banging my head against the floor and I'm saying, I do not understand this passage. Lord, will you please help me now? Uh, this is a very tough one for me to understand, uh, especially if you grew up in a household where mom was very strict about how you uh, came to the table with washed hands or not. Look at what it says in uh, verse 1 and 2. This is talking about just the infestation and the spread of the hypocrisy by the Pharisees and the scribes and, and how they, how they uh, stretch themselves out far and wide across the land. It says the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus, and this is important, from Jerusalem, and they said, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat. Now, here's the question. This is what, this is what real, really broke the camel's back for me, or I don't know what that mean, saying means, so I think, I, I think I'm going to say it the right way, but... If you were about to have a meal for yourself, and for whatever reason, we'll get into this in a second, you didn't wash your hands before you ate, can you imagine somebody coming to you from 100 miles away, Jerusalem, 100 miles away and saying, 
just want to let you know, you didn't wash your hands. You may want to work on that. Yeah, you shake your head and go, that, that doesn't sound quite right. There must be something more going on here than just hygiene. And what's going on here exactly is, the, is that's a good question to ask. What is going on here? You can read on your own, uh, Luke chapter 11. It doesn't just talk about the, the disciples did not wash their hands before they ate. Who else? Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 11. You can read it for yourself. He did not wash his hands before he ate. You could shake your head and go, I don't understand that. Could you please help me? This is talking about what I call the infestation of hypocrisy. First of all, this is not about sanitation. So if you're a nurse or you work in some kind of industry or a food industry where it's really important that you wash your hands before you prepare food or something like that, this is not talking about hygiene. This is talking about ritualistic ceremony. Remember, this is the first century AD. Back then, uh, people did not know about bacteria and they did not know how germs spread. So that's the first thing we got to remember. Second to that, it's the, it's the Pharisees and scribes that are saying this, and they're doing this for over a long distance. I mean, think about it, several days' journey, a hundred miles north to tell a person they're not washing their hands before they eat. What is going on here is in verse 2, uh, the traditions of elders. And you need to understand that that was strictly their tradition. That is not found in Scripture. You cannot find anywhere in Scripture that you must wash your hands before you eat. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in case you're curious. But that was solely their tradition. It was separate from the writings of Moses. It's separate from the entire Bible. Now, if you want to make a case for how do you love your brother? How do you love your sister? Well, wash your hands so you don't spread germs to them. That, that's, that's a principle that we can live by. That, that's sort of dovetailing off of another verse of Scripture. That's fine. But this is about the traditions of men. And the best way I can explain this for you is, uh, is to under, let you understand what was going on in, in Israel back in that day. Back in that day, in the first century, Israel had an occupation called the Roman occupation. And so when you have, like, let's just say for us, if we had North Korea, you know, in our backyard with a bunch of guys in soldiers' attire always, and there was maybe perhaps people in California who say, you know, this is enough, enough of this, we want to overthrow them, I would say you would probably have a strong nationalistic spirit within California that says, get rid of those guys who are trying to take us over. You would have a strong nationalistic spirit. Back then, that's exactly what was going on with the Pharisees and scribes. It wasn't just religious. It was nationalistic as well. On top of that, uh, they prized themselves as being the main guys. The uh, one, two, three, I, I don't, I'm not going to say this of myself. I better not say this of myself ever. But one, two, three, all eyes on me. Man-centered religion, not God-centered religion. Man-centered rela- religion is what the Pharisees and scribes were all about. And this was not just for Jerusalem, where they were from. This was to be spread far and wide, up and down Israel, all the way up to the Sea of Galilee, where a lot of the Gentiles were. It says in some commentaries that what was really going on here is that the Pharisees, number one, they knew who Jesus was, that he was a miracle worker, and that he had a big following, especially after feeding 5,000 people. 5,000 people, you can imagine, that word got around, even as far south as Jerusalem. They did not like that at all, that another person was getting more attention than, the, than they themselves. And, f- and furthermore, what is this? This Jesus, this, this, you know, in their mind, he's just a character, and his disciples and his following, they don't do what we do. We follow the tradition of the elders. We show our team spirit for the nation of Israel by washing our hands before we eat. And the thing that was most likely going on behind that was, in the Jewish mindset, to talk about goyim or, or the Gentiles was, ugh, gross. Are you a Gentile? You're not a true Jew? Well, if I'm seeing you in the, the, the market and we're buying food before we go out to lunch and, and we happen to come upon the same piece of fruit and we touch it together, you know what? You're goyim. You're a non-Jew. My hands are contaminated. So what do I do? I have to wash them. Wash off all that, that non-Jewish stuff. Get rid of that. Ugh, Gross. So that's what was literally going on with regards to these Pharisees and scribes. They had these additional rules. That is not found in Scripture anywhere, by the way, to do that. But in their mind, it was justified because, after all, if you're a true Jew and you're a true Pharisee, you fight for the nation and and you you stand up to those Gentiles and you say, we rule, and you do not. Um, So there was a lot of nationalistic pride going on on this as well, too. 
There's a second thing or third thing that I want to share with you on my personal reason on why I think Christ and his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate. And this is going to, this is going to be good. I think it's going to be good. <laughs> In America, we assume that when you turn on the faucet, you, what comes out of that faucet is clean water. Now, talk about Indonesia or another country or India. When it's time to bathe, is that water always clean? Yeah, who, who made the assumption that whenever you go to a place where there's water, that's clean water. Somebody else could be using it for a totally different purpose. Second to that, I don't know if how many of you watch war movies, or maybe not war movies, but footages of, of battles when you have a platoon of guys and, and they're in the middle of battle. Maybe it's the war of Iraq, maybe it's Afghanistan or something like that. Uh, and they're, they're a motley crew of guys. Uh, they're, they're, you know, their uniforms are ripped. Uh, they're trying to get through their day. They're being shot at from left and right. Do you think that these guys, uh, these, these platoons, when it, when it comes time to eat because they've got to kind of get their energy back, do you think they, they open their packs and go, oh, wait a second, uh, let's find some water? No, they don't. They, they, they say, you know, we're, we're on the run. Uh, there's no place for me to sleep. There's no five-star hotel for me to sleep at, so I have to sleep on a rock or underneath a tree. They're, they're kind of rough. They're just making their way through their tour. And no, know this, that Jesus and his disciples, they didn't stay at five-star hotels at times, they just had to sleep under a tree. They had a rough life uh, on and off. So don't expect them to uh, uh, be doing what we take for granted all the time. Sometimes they were on the run. Sometimes they had to go to another location really quickly. And so for that reason, they didn't have time to do this formality that other people did, not because of hygiene, but, sure, but solely for the reason of identification with Jerusalem. Another way just to explain this a little bit uh, more, and I think this will bring it home for you. I don't know how many of you are fans of the San Francisco Giants. Don't raise your hand if you are. It's fine. But um, if you're a fan of the San Francisco Giants, I, I always like to ask people, or I, I, I'm asking them now sometimes, uh, you like that team a lot, okay? Um, were you born in San Francisco? Well, no, I wasn't born in San Francisco. Uh, do you go there a lot? No, not really. But they represent Northern California, more or less. So that's the reason why, for some people, they would be big fans of the San Francisco Giants. And that's sort of what's going on here. Uh, even if you're up, way up in, in the Sea of Galilee, that's way north of Jerusalem, uh, if you are uh, part of the, the nation of Israel, you pay attention to what's going on down south with regards to Jerusalem. And if these guys, these... Sadducees and Pharisees, if they have a way of doing a way of doing things, a way of showing their team colors, by golly, you show your team colors just the same. And so that was what's going on here. It was an issue of the unity of the nation, showing your team colors, saying hurrah, hurrah for the most valuable players. The Pharisees and the scribes were so glad that we have these religious elite types on board. And what Jesus is doing here is he's he's turning the ship right around and he's showing these guys are actually the worst, the worst imposters. And this shows you the, the, the expanse of hypocrisy. It doesn't just stay in one place. It goes 100 miles north of the central place of Jerusalem. Think, think about this with regards to the prosperity gospel. I don't know how many of you have heard of the prosperity gospel. I think it started in, sadly, in the United States of America, where people had the wrong understanding of the gospel. How do you become right in God's eye? You earn a lot of money. You earn a lot of money, and then you're okay in God's eye. Rather than getting on your knees and asking for forgiveness over sin, you just try to see how much cash you can stuff into your pockets. That's the prosperity gospel. Is the prosperity gospel content in being on, on one side of the planet? No, it's not. The prosperity gospel jumps whole oceans and goes to places like Africa, goes to, place, goes to places like China and India, and it continues there. It like spreads like gangrene. Jesus Christ talked about this in many different forms, and, and, and we have a modern application of that today. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 12, verse 1. I think this really brings it home. He says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Let me say that again. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisee, which is hypocrisy. And you know how leaven works. You just add a little sprinkle of it, and it starts to germinate. And then the, your loaf or whatever, your bread, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and it pops the lid of whatever the container that it's in. 
That is what hypocrisy is like. It spreads. People latch on to it and they say, this is the ticket. This is how I become a religious Jew. This is how I become good and favorable in God's eyes. I do these things. I go through this list. I'm very fastidious. I go through this list every morning. And that's how I win God's favor. And then unfortunately, the list had nothing to do with regards to what the Bible actually said. And Jesus exposes that for us and even for the people around him. I love what Jesus does in the next part. We're now in the, looking at the inverted triangle of hypocrisy in verse 3. The elders, are, are, they're not just asking an arbitrary question. This is really a, a confrontation. And this is really a, what you might call a showdown or a standoff. Verse 2, they say, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Jesus answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. There even was a death penalty for being a sort of a a snot-nosed kid and, and just dishonoring them. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me, I have all this money, I have it all saved up for your latter years when you get older and you need help, but I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it is given to me, it is given to God actually, so it's on reserve, so you can't have it, sorry. Verse 6, you say that he not need honor his father, even though the Ten Commandments clearly says in commandment number five, honor your father and your mother. So for the sake of your tradition, which overshadows it, you have made void, that is, the word of God. And then he says, you hypocrites, and he goes on. What's going on here, and it's very clear what Jesus is doing here, he is exposing the inverted triangle of hypocrisy. And I'm going to have to back up a little bit to explain this just for us to understand. Throughout the Bible, I want to say this at the forefront, the whole word of God is all inspired, it's all of God. It's all authoritative from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We know that. Here's the question. Is the word of God flat? Or does it have a sort of topography up and down? Are there hills and valleys? Are there high points and perhaps even low points as well? If you read your Bibles enough, you kind of say, yeah, I think, I think that's right. There are some things that are more important than others. Can you say that? There are some commandments that are more important than others. Listen to the words of Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he, that is Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. He said, teacher, or rabbi, which is the great commandment of the law? See, sort of a standoff. Are you going to make a pyramid here and actually say one commandment is more important than another commandment? Sort of, as, again, it's a standoff. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the great and first commandment. Let me say that again. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's at the top of the pyramid. That's why of the Ten Commandments, the first three of the Ten Commandments all are about God. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Number three. Number two, don't make idols. You shall have only one God before you. That was all of God in the the very top of the Ten Commandments. Below that, the seven that came after that were all about your fellow man. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not covet another person's possessions. And so what Jesus is saying here is just really in concert with what we know from the Ten Commandments. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's, That's coming from your heart, from your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. Are you starting to see a topography now with regards to the word of God? That there's something that's primary, secondary, tertiary? We would say the things that, that, that are bottom rung would be traditions. And I need to just speak about traditions just a little bit. They're not entirely all bad. Um, did you know this? That uh, the command, there's no commandment in all of the Bible. Excuse me. Pardon me. There is no commandment in the Old Testament to be baptized. Remember when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus? Do you know there's nothing in the Old Testament from their time, from their standpoint, that says, thou must be baptized? It's not, it was a tradition. It's led by the Holy Spirit, of course, led by John the Baptist, who has the Holy Spirit, telling people to be baptized, are, are, are facilitating that. 
But you would not find it in the writings of Moses. You would not find it, find it in the prophets. There's nothing there about baptism. But this is the thing. Uh, over time, in the course of time in the New Testament, it was something that became normative. And then, of course, with the Great Commission, it became a commandment for us in the New Testament. But from the standpoint of the early Jew in the first century, uh, if you asked them, uh, what about this thing called baptism, they, they would not have a book, chapter, and verse to go to back then. So, so traditions are not necessarily, we, we should not, you know, eschew them or say that they're yesteryear or something like that all the time. But certainly, in, from the standpoint of the first century, there were things that were clearly primary. There were things that were clearly secondary. And then there were things at the bottom uh, that were just added on. And sometimes those things were helpful. Sometimes they were outdated and, 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 and they expired for their time. But at the top of the pyramid, for crying out loud, we know this is, is true, is to, comes first is the worship of God. We're not adoring a man unless the man is the God-man, Jesus Christ. We are not adoring a man. We're adoring the attributes of God at the very top. And that's what Jesus is directing their attention to. And what did the Pharisees do? They, they turned it right around. They made it so that their traditions, which basically could say, this is, this is demonic, this is hideous. Say, say you, you're sitting on a, I know maybe you're not, maybe you are, sitting on a truckload of cash. <laughs> but um, say, you're, say you have like lots of money gained from a really good career, and you're thinking in your mind, part of this has to go to my aging parents because they're getting older now, and they need help. These Pharisees and Sadducees made it so that you could kind of rub your hands a little bit and say, I think I got an idea. I think I don't want to let go of that money just yet, and I think I want to do this instead. It's on reserve, okay? It's on divine reserve for Corban. It's for God Almighty, so I'm just going to sit on it. Meanwhile, the parents are just going, who's going to care for us? Who's going to care for us? Well, mom, pop. Do your best on your own. You'll make, you'll make good. That's just flat out demonic. That's turning uh, love, your, honor your father and your mother is turning it upside down and showing no respect for them, just seeing them off to their grave, basically. He says, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain, it's pointless. In vain do they worship me. Teaching the doctrines, the commandments of men, mere men. These things that they made up is, is just solely that. It's just of their own manufacturing. It's an engineered religion that they were doing that didn't even come from the words of Scripture, didn't even come from the principles of Scripture. Greg, when he was up here, he read from uh, Matthew chapter 23. Uh, in one of those verses is verse 23. It talks about uh, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Those are the bedrocks uh, of everything you see in the Old Testament. Uh, it is very easy for anybody to just kind of go doting along with a tradition, uh, an open show of religiosity. But how easy is it to do faithfulness, justice, mercy, when your heart is going against mercy towards someone, when your heart is going against justice, when your heart is going against the direction of faithfulness? Those are hard things. But here's the silver bullet, folks. This is the easy way for you to be religious. Put those things aside and just give a little money to the temple and we'll say you're okay. There's a lot of people who in this current day and age, today, they do that very thing. They give a little bit of honor to the Lord, in quotes, and then they go about their painfully pagan, unchristian lives that totally turn their heels to the commandment of God day and night. Jesus is speaking against that, and he's pointing it out that for what it is. It's flat-out hypocrisy. And that really describes the inverted triangle of hypocrisy. You've heard of lip service before. What is lip service? Oh, praise the Lord. What do you mean by that? Praise the Lord. Are you seriously praising the Lord when you say praise the Lord, or is it just lip service? These, these Pharisees were guilty of exactly what Isaiah from the Old Testament times had warned them against giving God lip service and, and appear, appearing to honor the Lord when, in fact, their hearts were far from God all the time. So that's the inverted, uh, the inverted triangle of hypocrisy. That's how they turn things upside down. There's one more thing that we want to look at today as far as uh, hypocrisy, and that is the infestation, excuse me, the irony of hypocrisy. This is our last point in our outline, and that's uh, verse 10. What does it say there? 
It says he called the people to himself and he said to them, hear and understand. And, and what Jesus is going to do here in verse 10 is he's going to unfurl for everyone around him the, the despicable, despicable display of hypocrisy out in the open, you know, in all its stench. Hypocrisy has, a, has an outcome that is, you might say this, it's ironic. I mean, all these people trying to climb their way up this ladder, do all these deeds, and then they get to the top of the ladder, the thing peels over and drops them into the pit of hell. That's, that's ironic, and that's backwards itself, just the pathway of people who would follow these men. He called to the people. Jesus is, at this point, he's turning away from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it would seem, and he's calling to those who would listen to him. And he called the people to himself, and he said, look, listen, hear and understand. This is not what goes, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. And I need to warn you of this. I believe this is pretty, pretty hard talking. This is pretty hard to listen to. It's not what goes into the mouth. Everybody's concerned about washing their hands, uh, dietary laws, layers upon layers of dietary laws, extra laws, extra laws, extra laws, heavy yoke upon your shoulder. You're trying to lift up this weight just to be right with God. And Jesus is saying, get yourself away from that. Wean, Wean yourself off of that. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. It's what comes out of the mouth, and I would translate that myself, out of the orifice. This is what defiles a person. If you're wondering if that's what he means, look at verse 17 and 18. Peter says to Jesus, uh, do you not know that the the Pharisees find this offensive? What you just said is, by the way, very offensive. And Jesus says back to Peter, do you see what whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and it's expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and this defiles a person. Now, Jesus' intention here is not just being gross for the sake of being gross, but he's exposing for everyone the hypocrisy and and even the the vile stench of the Pharisees and what they were up to. He says they're all concerned about the first part. The first part is you wash your hands. The second part is you take the food. And then following the strict, strict dietary laws that they made up, you put it in your mouth and you start swallowing it. Then it gets processed through you. We don't usually talk about the tail end of that argument, but Jesus does. He says he comes out the mouth. That's probably in the direction of gravity. And this defiles a person. What Jesus is pointing to here is manure, uh, the backside of an animal when it comes out. And you might say, why would he do such a thing? That sounds so disgusting, especially for a Sunday morning, which you're thinking about right now what you're going to eat for lunch. It is disgusting. But Jesus wants everyone to know the, the, the disgust and the, the heinousness of what these guys were about. They were really about ignoring the things that are painfully, woefully hard for God to look at and for God to even smell. And that has to do with our sin. There's so much a, a kind of preaching today that always wants to talk about the positive. Positive, 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 positive. Let's never ever talk about the negative because if... I talk about the negatives with you, I might not get your vote, and that would be really bad for my career. Wow. What does Jesus do here? I don't think he's really concerned about the people's votes, number one. He's concerned about the truth of God's word. It says in verse 12, the disciples came to him, and they're saying, uh, God, he's scratching their heads, saying, uh, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when, you, when they heard you say this thing? And Jesus Christ just keeps on explaining how their direction of their lives is towards total destruction. Not by man, but ultimately by God. This is important that we we focus, and Charles will be preaching on this next Sunday, um, just the vileness of our hearts. That's what the next part is, by the way. Charles is shaking, nodding his head, so he's in agreement, so that's good. But the next part of this is, if you keep on reading, is talking about the vileness of the heart. That is not a positive thing. That's a very uh, hard thing to listen to, um, to talk about uh, seeing our heart in the eyes of holy God. Uh, We see each other, and I'm looking at you here, and you're looking at me, and I'm saying, I think we're pretty good. You know, I think we're we're looking pretty nice. Everybody's wearing colorful clothes, and that's, that's great. I think we're doing well. But does God look at us the way that we look at each other? No, he does not. 
He sees the inner recesses of our hearts. He sees what is in our bowels. And he sees what comes out when the doors are shut. That is what God sees. Jesus says to them, uh, do not follow them. Do not follow their teaching. They're trying to just elevate you with their own works, their own manufactured, engineered religion that is strange to the teachings of Moses. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. That is really the irony of hypocrisy if you think about it. And this goes back to the, you know, the illustrations of TBN and, and prosperity gospel. You, are, you have so many people who are on board with this modern day lie where they, they look at the television screen, they see somebody with a lot of riches, a lot of wealth, and they say, that's what I have to do. I just, I just copycat whatever he does, and, and I will win God's favor in the end. In the end, when I die, the Lord will receive me for all the riches that I have gained. And the Bible talks about a, a terrible day when people will say, I've done many things, Lord, in your name. And it says in Matthew chapter 7, he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And that's the, strict, that's the real irony of hypocrisy when it's, it, when it's unfurled and people ignore the sin that they need to repent of. It really comes around and it bites them and it bites them hard and it bites them for eternity. Uh, this is just a, a something for us to internalize as well too. I'm going to end the way that I kind of started and, and it is true uh, if you are basically doing your best, walking with the Lord, looking to his word, depending on Christ, depending on the promises of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, I would underscore this over and over again, you're not a hypocrite. Praise be to God, you're not a hypocrite. But that word hypocrite, by the same token, it lingers in our mind sometimes, and sometimes it's intended by the Holy Spirit that we think upon this word, even though we know people use it unjustly towards us. There can be visages, a little uh, budding shapes of, of hypocrisy in our heart that can just start to germinate, sometimes seemingly out of nowhere. And we need to pay attention to, the, to those things and really say, Lord, like David said to the Lord, you know, look at me, look, search my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me, O God. We, we should allow ourselves to do that just for the sake of our worship so that we can come before God with a pure heart, cleansed by the righteous blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. With that note, I'm going to, I've gone too long. I'm just going to close with prayer, but I want to uh, commit these things to your heart and to my heart as well too as we go into a new week. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we just want to thank you, God, for your word and how it teaches us uh, things that are true. And Father, we thank you that your word is lucid, is clear, it's not a mystery, Lord, that we can actually read it and understand it. We thank you, Lord, that we don't live in the day and age where people are ignorant. They don't have the word translated in their language yet. Father, we have the privilege of having your word translated in our language. Father, we would just pray that we would be good stewards of that. Lord, we would not follow false teaching. Lord, we would be true Bereans to the very end with our fingers in the word of God, looking for book, chapter, and verse, and asking the question, where does it really say that in the scriptures? Lord, we know that your, your promises will preserve us, Lord. And certainly, Father, we look at Christ. We lean upon the Savior at this time. And we ask, Lord, that you would be merciful with us, Lord, as we walk away from the sins of our past and we walk into your holiness by the power of your Son, by the power of the cross. Pray all this in your name. Amen.